years on a Hilbert space. And the one that people tend to use is L2 of the mass hyperboloid because the Lorentz group acts on that. And so the Lie algebra of the Lorentz group acts as operators on that. And that mass hyperboloid we will want to think of as the Lorentz group mod the rotation group. So there, you can talk about this Hilbert space of quantum area elements. And then from those little quantum area elements, you can build up tetrahedra. You see, an ordinary tetrahedron can be thought of as four area elements, which here I've drawn as, as vectors, but they're really bivectors, that add up to zero. If you know those area elements adding up to zero, that determines a tetrahedron. Uh, so we just quantize that description of a tetrahedron and think about the Hilbert space for four quantum bivectors, but then put in the constraint that they add up to zero, the operators add up to zero. And you can think of that as functions on four copies of this space, but that are invariant on the Lorentz group, because these Lorentz group generators kill it. So you get this funny kind of quotient space. And this space, the Hilbert space of a quantum tetrahedron, has a basis which just consists of, it's labeled by four numbers, which are just the areas of those uh, triangles. And so then we do, there are many ways to do this, but this is a, a, a very pretty way. We do this remarkable thing, second quantization, which is always seems strange to me, but it's no more strange now than ever. We take the wave function, this is the wave function for a quantum tetrahedron, we reinterpret it as a field. So I'm thinking of it as just a function on, on four copies of the Lorentz group that's invariant under these, uh, under these groups. So you think of it, but the main trick is we think of it as a field and then write down an action for it and quantize that theory, just like in quantum field theory. And this action has a quadratic part, which will give us a propagator, which will look like, like this in our Feynman diagrams. And it will have this funny looking degree five part where these crazy indices are just keeping track of all of the edges in a four simplex. So this 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, those are just all the, all, all the, all the ones coming out of this zero here, and the, that determines the pattern. So, so if you just quantize this theory, you get, you just following the old textbook techniques for, for quadratic plus higher polynomial actions, you get the path integral written as a sum of Feynman diagrams where the interactions have this chain mail form I described. And then you can calculate the amplitude for one of these vertices, and you just get this result, which is just a, a, a calculation, that the amplitude for this vertex can be thought of as an integral of the following mess. It's an integral over five points on the hyperboloid, which you think of as normal vectors to a four simplex, x1, x0 through x4. And then for each uh, triangle in your four simplex, you get a factor here that involves the area of that triangle and the dihedral angle of the two tetrahedra touching it. But now, in the causal Barrett crane model, you can actually say whether the ith tetrahedron lies in the future or the past of the jth one. And that means you can make this angle be signed. You can say if it's positive or negative. And you can replace this sine function, which is really a sum of two exponentials, by just one term, depending on whether one's in the future or the past. And then this amplitude just really just gives you the Regi action. The Regi action was hiding inside, but now it's visible. So in the causal Barrett-Crane model, you, you, you get just e to the i times the Regi action coming out. You also get this funny factor in front, and this has been the cloud cast over the Barrett-Crane model, as Carlo described it, which, uh, because this factor here is peaked at points where the, those angles are, are small, so you're looking at four simplices that are almost flat. Uh, but, as, but as Carlo pointed out in his talk, there, there's possible ways around it. There, it's possible that these degenerate simplices won't will sort of get wiped out when you actually do real physical calculations, although I'm not at all convinced that that's true, but, it, but, it, but in a first-order perturbative calculation, that was true. So I zipped through the Barrett-Crane model and showed you that the causal Barrett-Crane model is of the sort that admits time slicings, and it is closely related to the Regi action. So you could hope that, that some of the the uh, results 
of causal dynamical triangulations could be generalized to this. Of course, I'm not saying that this is by any means something to be taken for granted. You'd actually have to calculate it and see. Uh, and it's, but that would be a, a way to try to get a spin flow model that would have a nice limit that looked like general relativity at large length scales and was free of a preferred time slicing. That's, I think, a, a goal anyway. And I should emphasize that we should try to get a spin flow model that does this and not worry so much about making it beautiful until it works. So, for example, why are people wringing their hands about this action not looking quite like the Reggie action? I mean, if they're going to wring their hands about it, why don't you just define the action to be e to the i times the Reggie action? I mean, you may say, oh, that's cheating. We want the Reggie action to emerge. But really, cheating is not so bad. <laughs> if, if you get a theory that, of quantum gravity that works, do it however you can. So I, I urge people to just dive in there and do a lot of calculations and try to find a spin flow model that gives us quantum gravity. And then we can make it pretty. OK, I'll, thanks. I'm done. Questions? Yes? <laughs> the world is Lorentzian. <laughs> and if you <laughs> and if you have a theory of the world which can be described with respect to a time slicing with, without topology change, then under some conditions you can legitimately rewrite your Lorentzian path integrals or relate your Lorentzian path integrals to, to uh, Wick-rotated Euclidean ones, but only under certain conditions, which include the absence of, of topology change. Some other question? <clears throat> so then, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll just make a, um, a comment to your last point. Um, you say, well, let's write a convincing model and then, but uh, maybe I'm repeating something I was saying yesterday. It's, it's, it's far from obvious to see what the classical limit is for the model. It's not just enough to write a so it's hard to see what what? <clears throat> what is the classical limit of a model? There, oh. there are a lot of things that can happen. So <clears throat> sure. um, the, there's a lot of literature that said, says this is a model because it's more, uh, it looks more like what I think the model should be. Um, sure. um, right. I, was, so I just want to, again, break a. a oh, a, I hope a, I didn't convey, I hope. I was hoping I was making the same point. So, in other words, okay. part of why, part of why I'm emphasizing this work on causal dynamical triangulations, is that they actually did calculations to see what the continuum limit of some theory is, instead of just sort of talking about whether some theory was prettier than the other or more philosophically convincing than the other. You, there's no way you can, you can, you can tell if a theory is working without doing a lot of calculations. And I, I re really, uh, one thing I forgot to say is that people love to talk about non-perturbative quantum gravity as this wonderful thing. But if you really take non-perturbative quantum gravity seriously, it means that you're not going to be able to do calculations in it just on the back of an envelope. I mean, any, any sort of calculation you can do by hand <laughs> is likely to be some kind of perturbation theory <laughs> about something, some, some closed form calculation. So, so, so they're doing real non-perturbative quantum gravity, which involves summing over zillions of simplices, zillions of triangulations. And so you have to get your hands dirty, I think, to see whether things are going to work. Maybe if you're very clever, yes. If you're very clever, maybe you can avoid having to do all that work. But I think it's probably more work to figure out how to avoid doing all that work. <laughs> OK, let's thank John again. Our Thanks.